Also, guten Abend, meine Herren und Damen. My name is Chris Harches. Uh, I'm actually from Canada, but my uh, parents are from Germany. So my father's from Gelsenkirchen, and my mother is from a little town called Carbon, but she moved when she was two, so I don't think she can really count as German. They sent me to uh, Deutsche Schlachschule every Saturday morning from age seven to 14. So when my friends were playing hockey, of course in the game, or watching cartoons, I was learning about things like where Karl Ruga was and Reinhold has fallen and all stuff that as a kid, I did not care about at all. So, also I speak a kind of computer Deutsch, so this presentation is in English. So this talk, if hopefully you're in the right room, this is called Lessons Learned from 10 Years of Testing. So I used to have a big vanity slide. I'm going to save that for the end. Uh, so the secret about tests is that they're made of people, right? That is the secret that I figured out. And uh, it's, not, it's actually more than 10 years. It's since 2003, so 14 years. There's no uh, code or tests in this presentation, so you cannot copy anything that I'm doing here. So my, my experience with testing started in December 2002. I was six months into uh, working on a very poorly constructed dating uh, site, and no, I'm not going to tell you the name of it. It doesn't exist anymore, but I don't want people digging around to find my dirty past. Uh, it was one of these websites where businessmen who didn't like their wives could find people to cheat on. So, am I proud? No. Did I pay my mortgage for a while? Yes. Was my wife unhappy? Uh, she liked the money, but everything else she did. <laughs> uh, so. So it was a very small team, myself and uh, four other developers, and some really uh, cranky sysadmins who made me look like a happy-go-lucky person, and a database administrator who did everything through uh, PHP, uh, my admin, and uh, we tried to build this thing, and it was terrible. We made most of the mistakes that people made at that time, except remember, this is 2002, so there's no frameworks, there's no composer. Um, Google wasn't even really being used yet, so it was all Altavista and hoping that you found something that was useful. So, as we got closer and closer to Christmas, it turned into uh, the English phrase is a death march. I don't know if there's a German equivalent. Uh, so, I was headed towards burnout. I had a super long commute. I was living out in a, like a third ring suburb of uh, Toronto in Canada, and I used to take the commuter train in. And it was 90 minutes for me to get to work and two hours to get home because I had to make some train connections and things didn't always work. And then as we got closer, we started with mandatory overtime, uh, which meant I worked 120 hours of overtime in the four weeks leading up to Christmas to try to get this thing done. I was unhappy. My, uh, my, my fellow programmers were unhappy. Management was unhappy because they were spending a lot of money buying us all pizza because you had 20 people who needed to be fed. Um, you know, but most importantly, my wife was super, super unhappy. So we launched, and it was, it was terrible. Uh, the thing crashed hard. We had uh, problems like bugs all over the place. Um, we were using MySQL replication, and the uh, various um, uh, nodes were 30 minutes behind the master. <laughs> All this up to the DBA said, no, 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 replication is instantaneous. This was my first exposure to the fact that your coworkers might actually lie to you about things. <laughs> so, so many of our assumptions were wrong about what we were doing, what we were building, how we were going to build it. So it resulted in the guy who used to be my ride home when we were doing all the overtime getting fired. Um, he was the team lead. They blamed him for the problem. And so, uh, in the aftermath of the launch, after the new year, I was in the, in the office with the uh, project manager, a very nice gentleman named Todd, and they were convinced I was going to quit because they had fired the team lead. And so my wife was like, no, you can't quit. We have a mortgage. My kids were really, really little. My kids are now, I have two daughters who are now 12 and 18. So at the time, uh, my youngest wasn't even around yet, and, and my oldest had no idea anything was going on. So the project manager was like, I'm glad I don't need this. He opened up a drawer and threw like a, they had a package. They were ready to fire me and had paperwork in and he just threw it in the garbage. So we started talking about this stuff. And he said, Chris, I think uh, you should borrow this book and, uh, over the weekend and read it. I think you'll find some things that are exciting in it. So this, for those who can't see all the way at the back, 
This is extreme programming installed. So this is uh, Ron Jeffries and Ann Anderson and Chip Hendrickson and a bunch of people. And uh, he's super awesome, Kent Beck, because the lettering's in gray and you can't see it going forward. And this was my first exposure to unit testing. And I'm not going to exaggerate. It was the moment that changed everything for me. If you saw Gary Hawkins talk this morning where he talked about how contributing to open source led him to be on the stage to talk to all of us, this book and the chapter on unit testing was how I ended up here, you know, where I fly halfway, you know, I fly all the way across the Atlantic and, and come here and talk and, and hang out with you folks. But I'm, I'm not even kidding. It's this, it literally changed my life. Uh, I was introduced to the idea of unit testing. I was like, oh my god, you mean there was actually a way we could have prevented our customers from being our QA department? That we could have found these bugs before everybody else did? And uh, so when I got back, I spoke to Todd and said, hey, I read this thing about unit testing. Let me have a day to do some research and see if there are any tools that could help us do it. And so, again, I know I keep knowing. I know it's not like an old man. I'm 46, so I've been doing programming for about 20 years. I got actually got a late start as far as programming goes. But you can imagine in 2003, what testing tools were there even out there? Well, you use simple test, which was like a web version of PHP and sort of, and lots and lots of swearing. Because as you're trying to figure out these tools and these techniques, I had no idea really what an assertion was, I had no idea about test doubles, I had no idea about anything to do with testing. All I knew was I never ever wanted to work 120 hours of overtime for anybody for any reason ever again. If it meant I quit jobs, if it meant I got fired, if it meant I constantly argued with people, it was never going to do it again. And you also have to remember, uh, PHP Unit hadn't even been released yet. This morning, I checked, the first public release of PHP Unit was in 2004. So you've got to remember, I'm not trying to build a web app back then. No PHP Unit to do your tests. There's no frameworks for you to argue with people about which one you should use. So you had to do everything literally uphill both ways in the snow, as the old uh, English expression goes. So what happened? Uh, there was so much little PHP-specific testing involved. Google was even around. I remember I used AltaVista and other alternative search engines to try to find information. Nobody was doing this in PHP. And if they were doing it, nobody was sharing, which was probably the biggest problem. So it caused lots of sadness as I sat there and tried to figure out how can I get this team of developers who have created this terrible, terrible application so that we can fix it. So we got down to it. We got the Apache error logs. We sorted everything by frequency of the bug appearing in the, in the log. And it was like 200 bucks for us to fix. So we got to it trying to do test cases and simple tests to fix everything. Um, but what I did learn, and this is lesson number one, is that having one person where you work who's enthusiastic about testing, it, it's simply not enough. Um, testing, test evangelism, what I do, is a very lonely job. You get lots of people telling you that you're useless and you should shut up and why are we paying you to be here, right? Uh, because it requires people to do things in a way they didn't do before. But being enthusiastic about it just simply isn't enough. We've all heard of cowboy coders, you know, who go off and do their own thing. Um, there's cowboy testing, and I've done this, and instead of it being for fun and profit, it's for anger and sadness. You can start off being the only one where you work, writing tests, and this is even still true today, but company culture might make you regret it. Uh, you'll get lost, this is especially um, important if, uh, unlike me who has had the ability to work at, I guess, regular um, jobs as a PhD developer, I never did uh, consulting work, uh, I never did uh, work for like an agency, so I never really worked in an environment where uh, testing was going to be outright rejected as you know, um, no time, or what I hear all the time, I'm not paying for tests. Yeah, you're going to be paying for something else later, is what I always tell people. But if you try to do it on your own, you might regret it. So that's always a thing to consider. So, sometimes you want to write the test, but you can't do it because it's going to cause you too much trouble for your job. I've always told people, if you don't like your job, you should quit and go work somewhere else. Life is too short. The robots are coming for us as programmers, but they're not here yet. So we still have some time to make a whole bunch of money before I'm going to be forced to just uh, sit at home with my wife and go swimming in my pool and in my hot tub and hope that, uh, I don't swim in the hot tub though, um, and just hope that I can find something else to do with my time. But they're not here yet. We as programmers 
are still highly in demand, highly paid. Uh, life is too short to work a crappy job. There are so many interesting things to do uh, with programming, and even in industries where you don't think software could have an impact, they're looking for people too. So always keep your eyes out for, for interesting new jobs. Um, so, you know, we start doing this stuff, and the tests will continue until bugs no longer happen, but of course, bugs will continually happen. Uh, and where I worked, there was so much complaining about, uh, I managed to get buy-in from Todd, and Todd went to the person who was in charge of all the developers, and he's like, hey, this thing sounds great, so we'll never have a, another crappy launch. Of course, I sniffed thinking, there's gonna be nothing but crappy launches for, um, until the heat death of the sun for this particular application. So, we started testing, and things were going good, but in every meeting, there were complaints. I'm not done my work, because I had to write these tests. I don't understand how to write these tests. Why is Chris still working here? Why is Chris constantly standing behind me making sure that I'm writing tests? A, a theme I still hear today from people where I work. Um, but what happened is tests got written, and so the application slowly, slowly got better. And I started to get more interested in the process of testing, trying to learn, okay, so when am I supposed to use a test double as opposed to the real thing? And, and is, are there strategies for like organizing your tests? And just basically wanting to learn more and more about it. And at the same time I was doing this, I went to my first um, PhD conference in Toronto. Um, I saw Rasmus Lerdorf talk, saw some other uh, PhD folks talk. I was like, this is awesome. And then on top of it, I found out you can submit papers to talk about these things, and they'll pay you to come and talk. I was like, I'm like Gary, I like money too. So I was like, great, I'm going to start submitting talks. So I, so I spoke at my first conference in 2005 at the conference uh, that was the precursor to Con Food that happens in Montreal every uh, March when it's freezing cold in Montreal. That's why I'm not going to it's too cold. So then what happened is I lost a political struggle. Um, at that job, at the dating site, to get the job that I want. It was yanked away from me at the last second because I never went drinking with the person who was going to be in charge of me. So, how could you drink all the time when you had a two hour train ride home, right? It's how I always looked at it. So, this is in early 2006. At the end of 2005, I'm like, all right, this is a common pattern. I'm out of here, right? I don't want to stick around if I'm not going to get what I want. So I, I got a job with a company that owned a huge number of websites that are forum software using this product called vBulletin. Anyone ever hear of vBulletin? Uh, a few fellow sufferers. Okay, that's good. Uh, so I was hired to just kind of help them solve some problems that they were having and to build some tools for reporting. So I was asked to build a bunch of reports that were collating Google Analytics information. And then I discovered some code to build these graphs and it was with the Cape PHP project. And so that was my gateway into open source software. And actually, they did have some tests for it on, but it also taught me how, the whole interacting with people on the mailing list, taught me how to be a very difficult person, and also taught me how to deal with difficult people. Because as we all know, programming is full of difficult people. Uh, so this is lesson number two that I learned was uh, if you look at any sort of open source project, if it has tests, it means that at some point, somebody at least cared about what, about what they were doing. There's plenty of projects that have been abandoned halfway through. I've certainly done enough of those. But if they have tests, it means at some point somebody sat down and said, I want some tests because I want to make sure my code's not breaking, uh, that I verify everything's working as expected, that we can make refactoring easier, and also to lie so people tell themselves when they first get into testing. Right? So um, the test, the reason why tests are so good to have around is not just because they can prove that your stuff's working correctly. Tests provide windows into bugs. If you look at tests, you can often see, oh, that was kind of a weird thing that they were doing. Uh, why are they doing this setup step? What, there's a plus one here, there's a minus one here. They're looping and inserting records into a database and then they're doing something at the end. That seems really strange. And I can see why there was a bug. There was a race condition, so they finally fixed it. Um, but the tests provide windows into bugs, which is always good because when someone new comes onto a team, if you have a lot of tests, it's very easy to say to somebody, if you don't understand how this code works, go look at the tests and stop bothering me, right? But again, as I keep coming back to this, tests are still written by people. And because we're not robots yet, uh, people make mistakes. And another common thing is people are willing to argue about everything and anything. Uh, you know, and the, the tests are my bug fixes. They'll, they'll help you figure out. Uh, it's like uh, 
It's like the old you wrote a diary entry. Your diary, today I had to fix a bug because I don't understand conditional, um, I don't understand how to break out of a loop early, right? No little love notes uh, to the future you so that you don't hate the you that you used to. Um, but they also show you how to use the code, and that's very, very important. Many, many times when I've gone to use a third-party tool or library, they have tests. The documentation is out of sync with, um, with the actual code because people hate writing documentation. So I go to the test and figure out how to use something. So I think of your test as stealth document, documentation. But tests are written by people, and um, bad tests happen. It's inevitable, right? Sometimes you get people that don't fully understand the, the higher level concepts surrounding tests, what you're trying to do, what are our goals, right? You know, uh, they use they use uh, test levels when they shouldn't, and and they're fixated on data providers, and they do all these sort of weird things, or they, or they just cut and paste code everywhere, and it could be very easy for us to reduce, you know, like 10 or 11 tests into two tests with one data provider. But these are just all things you, you learn um, through failing to write tests properly, right? Uh, so the thing too about all this stuff, the, the problems that people have with tests, the critics use uh, the fact that people struggle to figure out how to uh, write tests uh, as proof that they don't work, right? Because again, people want to argue about everything and anything. People look at tests and some people intuitively realize this means I'm going to have to do more work, right? Tests are code, so you're going to have to write more code. And some people are like, I don't want to write any more code than I absolutely have to. So they dig in their heels and they say no. I'm not going to write any more tests. I'm not going to listen to Chris. I don't care what he has to say, right? But those people are wrong. <laughs> and it's not just my opinion that they're wrong. Finally, we have enough proof in the form of studies. But I will relate this one study to you. Um, back in the mid-2000s, at a rare time, when IBM and Microsoft agreed on something, rather than arguing about patents and, and suing each other, they got a bunch of people together and uh, assign them the same task. And they ask one group to do, to solve the task using test driven development, and the other group to not. They could do whatever they wanted, they could do um, ad hoc custom tests, they could do no tests at all. They could do, you know, uh, what a lot of people still do, uh, save your file, refresh the browser, and see if it worked. So, what they found was that the, the team that used test driven development, it took them 15 to 30% longer to get the task to deliver a finished application, right? Which makes sense if you understand that tests are extra code. So of course, you have to write more code, it's going to take more time. But on the other hand, the applications that they delivered had 40 to 90% fewer bugs make it up into production. So if you're like me, you want to manipulate the numbers to your advantage, you tell your boss, hey, you know what, for one extra day a week, will have 90% fewer bugs. But that's proof that test driven development and testing in general does result in better outcomes. You're exchanging a little bit of time for a lot fewer bugs. Also, a, uh, a concept I want people to understand, when you're doing these tests, you're also trying to move the cost of fixing a bug from the most expensive time, which is like Friday at 9 p.m. when no one else can figure out why this thing isn't working, to like a Tuesday morning when the developer's sitting in their cubicle with their noise canceling headphones on so nobody bothers them, uh, trying to solve the problem. Uh, developer, developer time is, is these days uh, you know, one of the cheapest things that you can do. And every step along the way from, from the initial developer to a code review, to staging, to production, every step along the way where a bug shows up, it costs way more than if you had just stopped being difficult and let your developers write tests. I mean, some bugs that make it to production are catastrophic. Some are easy, it's like 30 seconds to fix. The syntax error is you don't have any linting when you commit your code. To like bugs that could bring a company down. I certainly uh, had one of those. Well, not didn't bring the company down, but it caused a bunch of servers to crash where I created that. That dating site also <clears throat> was into porn as well. And so uh, I, had to create a, I had to create a photo gallery app for them for people to scroll through and vote on, uh, vote on which pictures they liked, right? Uh, a lot of fun doing the research, but you got desensitized to all that stuff pretty quickly. And so, when they launched the application, I had done such a terrible job that the free servers I was running on crashed immediately when the public started using it. So, that was a very awkward meeting. It was a very awkward train ride home. It was a very awkward train ride back in the next day, wondering if I was just showing up to pack up my stuff and uh, uh, 
get on a bus that instead of taking two hours, it takes three and a half hours to go home. So failures, due to bugs. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're not avoidable. Sometimes you have bugs that nobody can find. You can't find them in your unit tests. You don't find them in your integration tests. Or you don't find them in your end-to-end -end tests. And you don't find them when a human makes one last desperate sweep through the application to figure out if everything's okay. So I left that job uh, with the forum stuff in, uh, let me think now, yeah, like about 2007. And I decided I wanted to work from home. Uh, because my kids were little, I was never seeing them, I was like really unhappy with the commute. And then some, through some connections that I made through speaking at conferences, just like Gary was talking about, all those connections that you make, I managed to get my first remote job. So I've been working from home uh, for 10 years now. And I'll go back to an office when I'm dead. So I spent some years out there bouncing around from job to job, trying to find the right fit, trying to find a group of people who were doing stuff I was interested in. Uh, and then I started to really dig in, to really learn about testing, with the goal is I wanted to take what I was learning and teach other people the same thing. Now, there was some selfishness to this. I wanted to make some more money. I wanted to travel and go to conferences. But my mother is a retired high school teacher, so I'm sure Somewhere deep inside of me is that awesome work ethic that she has that I don't have to teach people about stuff. Um, you know, genetically programmed to teach, I guess. Um, so I really started to learn. And this is where I discovered that people struggle to learn about testing without help. When I first learned about this stuff in 2003, very little in the way of resources. So many parts of it were non-intuitive. Um, I see other people trying to figure out how to learn testing on their own. And without somebody sitting next to you, actually showing you and going through, we're going to write a test. We write a test as if everything works already. And then we keep writing code until the test passes. That is an alien concept to many people. And PHP itself, due to a really low barrier of entry, which is awesome because it means people can build amazing things in PHP without caring about the quality of the code, because the documentation is so good and there's tons of examples. And there's lots of stuff on Stack Overflow to cut and paste into your application to get things to work. So you can build stuff without caring. But testing requires caring, and it requires discipline, and it requires structure. And some people just, they can't do it without help. I know I'm not perfect about this stuff. Even today, I still sometimes try to cut corners and do things a little different. But you can't do it without help. Um, because the examples that we see online are way too simple. People want to find shortcuts. Because again, a lot of developers are lazy. You only want to do something once and never do it again. And then a uh, common theme, people want to argue about tools and techniques. Like, is it any wonder my Twitter handle is grumpy programmer? I mean, I have to explain this to people over and over again. They explain stuff to my kids over and over again, and it drives me nuts. So TDD isn't simple because testing is. Um, one of the books I wrote was kind of about what I felt was the minimum amount of information that you needed to know in order to test, and I was astounded when I wrote down every single thing that you had to do. I was like, Phew. no wonder people can't figure this out on their own. It's totally non-intuitive. The idea you're writing code, you're duplicating code that might already exist in your application so you can prove that it works, and what are these test doubles, and how, how do I load the database, and why do, I, why do I not want to talk to the database, and how do I talk to this third-party API that we're using? There's all these questions. That, you know, it's like my kids ask me over the same question over and over and over again. All right? So many times I tell them just like, well, ask your mother, but there is no equivalent of a mother. The test is going to be I can't say go ask Sebastian because Sebastian's not going to give them an email address. Right? <laughs> so not only is the concept of testing not simple, your code isn't simple. Uh, you know, that's, this is one of the problems. I can show examples of uh, test driven development, show you oh, a very simple thing, here's an example, we're going to go over it. But then the first thing in your mind is going to be, but that's not going to work with my code. My code isn't clean like that. I have all these weird dependencies all over the place. Uh, it, takes, it takes two hours for my application to be deployed. How am I possibly going to get that thing running on my own laptop or on my own workstation? So, you know, everybody's got their own unique problems. So it's very hard because I can offer generic advice. But you know, as much as I would like to get paid to do it, I can't sit next to every single person out there and guide them through the process. I try for my books and talks like this, but it's so overwhelming. You really need to sit down with somebody who knows what they're doing about testing so they can show you. Because I think one of the things of, of, of 
come around to understanding as I teach people about this stuff, is that I used to be focused on how to use the tools themselves, like that, the minutia. I don't know what the German word is. So. Also, you know, I know I talk like really, really fast, even for English speakers. So if I say a word, like some weird Canadian slang word that you don't understand, please stop me and I will go back and not be such a difficult person. Um, but so I've, I've found that I used to focus on here's how you create a double, here's how you create an assertion, um, here's how you actually create a test class. I discovered that was like just the tip of the iceberg of, that was lurking underneath ready to destroy your application, right? I found it more important to teach techniques why we're using this assertion, why we're organizing code this way, um, why are doubles important, why are data providers so good, why, why should we annotate our tests and group them so that we don't have to run them all the time? Why are fast running tests important? Why should we worry about this bug, the, the, the uh, bug filter pyramid with uh, unit tests being the base and, and integration testing? All that stuff that you discover when you get into testing. It's because the tools and techniques are transferable. In my day job, I work for Mozilla. Please use Firefox, but if you don't use Firefox, it's okay. Money shows up in my bank account twice a month, regardless of what browser you use. Um, but at Firefox, uh, with Firefox, I work with the Firefox test engineering team, and I test services. And there's only one little PHP project left at Mozilla, and of course, I get to test it. Um, but I write uh, integration tests all day long, mostly using Python. And so I found all the techniques I learned about testing with PHP were 100% trans uh, transferable. So if you have an application where you've got a lot of PHP, and you have some JavaScript, well, guess what? There's unit testing tools for JavaScript. And they work really, really well because I've used them. Um, so it's transferable. It's a skill you can take with you to new jobs and even new languages. So that sort of stuff is kind of important. Because then you can take those things that I've taught you, but the technique about why. Why am I doing this? Just like with my kids. Daddy, why am I doing this? Because I told you to. But I don't always do that with adults. So you might kind of snort at me or other uh, people who are trying to teach you things about testing about yet another FizzBuzz example, or we're going to build something that, that converts uh, um, um, Arabic numbers to, uh, to Roman, you know, Roman uh, numbers. Uh, it, we just need something to work on so we can show you how to do things. Because I don't want to do the work for you, because I'm even more lazy than the average developer. I want to teach you so you can go and do it. Right? So you can be frustrated just as much as I am. <coughs> so, so if you're not paying attention to the process, uh, when people are trying to teach you about testing, or even any other um, programming concept. If you get too hung up on the thing that you're building as opposed to how you're building it, you are going to miss out on a lot of stuff. This is what I discovered. You just can't learn these testing things uh, in isolation. I've yet to learn, I've yet to run across anyone who is really enthusiastic about testing who learned it all on their own. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit easier now that uh, there's lots of examples online, there's lots of videos and screencasts of people doing stuff, but still, there's nothing beats sitting down next to someone who knows what they're doing and then guiding you through, here's how we're gonna write a test, here's how we go back and refactor the test, now that we have a couple more cases, here's how we're gonna refactor your application code to make it, excuse me, easier to test. Can't do my isolation. I tried for many years, and eventually I resorted to just like emailing people's names I would find on old Usenet mailing lists, and bugging people like Sebastian, and bugging other people who knew something about testing, so I could learn, because I just, I couldn't figure it all out by myself. Uh, and another concept that people understand in these tests, this test is code with a specific purpose. We're writing code to do scenarios. We're trying to prove that our, our assumption about the way some code is supposed to work is true. These tests all kind of, you know, when you're using TDD, they all kind of start to look the same. You have the range step, where you're creating all your dependencies, whether they're real ones, fake ones, you're making calls to initialize databases, all the stuff you need to do to prepare your application to be tested. Then, we're, then uh, we're acting on stuff where we're creating the object that we're going to test, and we're going to exercise a method, and we're going to get a response back. And then we have an assertion step where we're trying to prove uh, that, our, that our assumptions about how this code works are correct. Um, you rec I start to recognize that shape of that code. I start to recognize when people are kind of straying a little bit lost in what they're trying to do, that they don't fully understand the, why they're writing tests. They may be writing tests because they've been told to write tests, but they don't understand 
uh, why we're writing tests. Because, I mean, fewer tests is better, less code is better. Um, you know, we all have a limited number of keystrokes in our hands. I know some of my peers are already having problems with uh, carpal tunnel and stuff. Uh, luckily, my wife always says that I don't work hard enough to ever hurt my hands, so I'm okay for now. But at some point, maybe one day my hands are going to get up and I won't be able to do this anymore. Uh, so this is why I'm kind of changing what I teach people, right? It's no longer enough just to show people how to use the tools, right? The how is easy. There's lots of examples on how. The why is, uh, is much more. I want to show where your tests go, when you should be writing these tests and why to use them, when they should be run, why we should be thinking about repeatable processes, why we should be thinking about how do I take things from where my application is manually deployed to it happens automatically. Maybe we have a build server that runs and grabs my code and checks it out on GitHub and runs all my tests. And if everything's okay, we, we flip the sim link or we uh, update a DNS entry. Those are all things that they don't seem like they're about testing. But there, I think the English phrase is a, it's a, a second order problem. The first order problem is like I want to test things. So the consequence of starting to test things is that you have you start asking all these other questions about what am I doing right, what am I doing wrong, how do I keep the tests going, how do I get people to keep using the tests? These are all these are all questions that I get asked all the time. And sometimes I have good answers, and sometimes I don't. Um, so shortcuts. We're all developers. We, we give shortcuts uh, a fancy name that sounds like we know what we're doing. We call it technical debt. But it is a shortcut. It's we're, we're, we're trying to do something to save time. We know it's wrong deep down in our hearts. We know it's wrong not to have tests. Um, so we take shortcuts. This is the thing I've heard so many times in meetings at places where it was a struggle to get tests working. I would be finished with this task if I didn't have to write the test. Or I've written the code, I still need to write the test. Or I didn't run the test because the test suite isn't running, right? Or I didn't run the test because it took too long. It's a great story about test suites. I was working for a place where all the developers worked on one shared server. And I, can see, I, I bet you can see where this is going. So, this application actually had close to 100% uh, code coverage. For their tests. And, by, and by code coverage, and it's a, a statistic that says when we run our tests, that is the percentage of our code that actually gets executed by the tests. 100% is the holy grail, um, but it still doesn't mean your application is bug free because weird edge case, edge case things happen. Uh, a code base with 100% code coverage simply means we, uh, we have tests for all the bugs that we can think of when we're writing code. So what happens is that the test suite was really slow to run, like 30 minutes slow to run. So most people are going to hesitate to run a test suite that takes that long because you want instantaneous or nearly instantaneous feedback. I want to change something. I want to run my tests. And before I complain about uh, having to work with these people that don't want to write tests, I should have my results back. So inevitably, people only ran the tests for their one little bit of code they were working on. And then when we got close to the release, uh, date was every two weeks we did a release. Then people on the shared server started running their tests. So you had like 20 people running their tests all at the same time. And they ran the tests on a shared database server. And we weren't using uh, doubles for the uh, for database connections. So inevitably, we would have race conditions. Some people would delete tables and delete rows as part of the test, and then you'd have another test that's trying to run and wants to access those things, so we would have failures. And then inevitably, the, the uh, engineering manager would come out of his office and start yelling at everybody to stop running their tests all at the same time, and, and his favorite person would be told to run those tests, and it wasn't me. He would run the test for the whole thing, and then he would give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So you can imagine a bunch of 20 developers who are trying to get their stuff done, and just because of the system they're forced to work under, there was no way to get all your work done on time. You had to rely on the kindness of strangers to not run your test at the same time. People propose crazy things like, let's build a queue, and we'll put in everyone's test request, and then we'll execute all the tests in the queue. And I was like, oh my god, I need to update my resume and get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to tell you that in terms of all this testing stuff, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to having a well-tested uh, code base. 
Um, there's just lots and lots and lots of work to try and create things with the fewest bugs possible. I know this is a theme that comes up all the time. We're not writing code, we're trying to solve problems. And I know that's like a thing that a lot of people say to try to maybe make yourself feel better about what you're doing. Um, that if you're not so good code, okay, I'm, I'm solving some problems, bro. Right. We're gonna go play some foosball in a minute, you know. Um, but uh, when I came around to the idea that yeah, I need to pay attention to like the problems I'm trying to solve, and everything I do as a program is aimed towards helping someone solve a problem. Um, because when you have a, a code base with lots of bugs, so not only is everyone unhappy, uh, not only is there no confidence when we go to deploy to production that things aren't going to break. There's also a lost opportunity cost. Every, uh, if, if you're uh, like a, you know, a tech lead and you have people working under you, would you, what would you prefer? That people are working late to fix bugs and maybe you want people to work more hours for the same money? I don't know, I think you're a monster for feeling that way. But if you also want to have your people uh, working on new things, new things that could provide value to your business, instead of going back and constantly fixing the same types of bugs, right? Lost opportunity is a real thing. For many businesses, there's things that they need to do to deliver value. Maybe you need this new feature because the big client says they want it, and if they don't get it by Friday, they're going to cancel the contract, and maybe you're going to get out of the job, right? There's lots of real-world pressures, but so many of them are, so much of these can be alleviated by a good test suite and having a plan on what you want to do. You, you won't find, if you, once you get up to a good level of code coverage and your developers all understand what we're doing here, why we're writing the tests, then you will get a chance to like catch your breath and not work all these crazy hours like I had to all those years ago. You know? You'll be proud of the work that you do in terms of like the code release is bug free and you'll be able to keep things moving forward. New features, new ideas, you'll actually get to go back and refactor code that you know sucks, but you wrote in a hurry because you need to get this done before you went on vacation. These are all real things. They all have a real impact, but people don't understand. Uh, people are, in general, people are terrible at assessing risks. This is why we end up with things like uh, United States electing a complete buffoon as their president. And as a Canadian, I get to watch this and go, I can't, like, I just kept watching and go, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way, and then, holy crap, they actually did it. So, but, people are, <laughs> but people are terrible at understanding the consequences of a, of a decision made here, what happens over there. Um, if you've ever heard of the idea of chaos theory, it's the idea, you know, uh, a butterfly flapping its wings causes, a, causes a, a, a hurricane halfway around the world, right? Okay, that's like pretty, uh, I don't know, that's, uh, that's exaggerating a lot of things, but it's consequences, decisions, they all pile up. All the little decisions you make, sometimes you don't understand the thing that you did a week ago is the reason why you can't do the thing you want to do today. Consequences, they happen. So, no shortcuts for testing. Um, you know, there's a reason why so many successful open source projects have really good test suites, right? Because they want to keep moving forward. They want to fix bugs that are showstoppers that come up. The tests are a way for them to, to protect themselves, to make sure the code quality stays high, that they're delivering value, that they can go back and fix things, because every project, no matter how good it is, has technical debt lurking in it somewhere. Things that could be better, things that, that could be changed, things that need to be changed going forward. Uh, that's what we're trying to do with all this stuff. Almost done. So, uh, I'm going to speed it up here a little bit. Uh, I have about 10 slides left. So, so I started writing, after I started uh, working from home, and found a succession of like, really cool things to do related to programming. I did sports data, I worked for an online learning place. Um, I had a job with the Cape Development Corporation, which was a consulting arm of the Cape PHP framework. All sorts of really cool things. I worked for a, a consulting company. I used to work with Marco Pavetta, so I know all about Gary saying Marco is always watching you. I know all about this stuff. So lesson number four that I learned is that all these testing problems and techniques were solved in the 1970s when I was uh, like a little kid and in kindergarten. Many of these problems, because I'm 46 years old, so I do remember the 70s. And they were okay to be a little kid. They're all solved. This book right here, this is Boris Weiser's uh, Software Testing Techniques book. A friend of mine online said, Chris, you, you would really like this book. He reads tons of programming books and white papers and, and stuff like that. And I never read that stuff because I'm mostly self-taught as a programmer. He said, go buy a copy of this book. 
Um, it's not new. You can find used copies on Amazon. As a software tester, every single approach you ever need to worry about, how do I test X? It's in here. Boris figured it out almost 30 years ago. Think about this. All the stuff that, that we're reinventing and we argue about, somebody else already did it. And we're so ignorant. We think we're the first ones who ever came across a particular problem. But no, somebody else like way smarter than me with like a super awesome beard and wearing suspenders figured all this stuff out years and years ago. And so now I would rather use somebody else's work to solve my problems rather than waste, waste mental energy trying to reinvent something that someone solved. Because this is the last lesson, the problem is people. It's not the tools, it's not the techniques, it's people. Because of this, this problem, right? Program related dis uh, discussions, they turn toxic. So, so quickly. Just like pretty much anything else we discuss online, the combination of like the ability to fire off a quick little snarky response while being anonymous. Um, I mean, I, try, I, I used to do a lot more uh, playing the character, shall I say, on Twitter than I do now. And it was so easy just to troll people and insult them and do all this stuff because there were no consequences. No one was going to hop in their car and drive across the border up to Canada and like punch me up because I called me an idiot. It was, just wasn't going to happen. So people feel safe to insult people and degrade people and argue about things that we shouldn't be arguing about. Like, does it really matter what framework you use? Is it really worth like uh, getting piled on by people for saying I prefer framework X to framework Y? It's so stupid. We need to move past that stuff, right? We're trying to solve problems. Like, like don't get me wrong, Symphony is nice. I use it to build a project, my open source one. Well, I use a Silex, so eventually I'm going to have to strip a lot of that stuff out and do proper Symphony. But I'm comfortable with Symphony. But the idea that Symphony is like miles and miles uh, better than something else, I don't know how Symphony comes from. Man, that's, just, that's a lot of ego. That's a lot of toxicity. <laughs> uh, like we should be like understanding, we're trying to solve problems. We're like incredibly lucky. We're going to pay a lot of money to screw around on a computer and solve problems for people. And we're losing sight of that. Even discussions in testing. I have people arguing me about whether we should use test doubles or not. We shouldn't use test doubles. They're so bad. Uh, the Ruby and Rails people never use test doubles. And my response is always, well, then go use Ruby on Rails then. Like, I use doubles because I understand when I'm supposed to use them and when I shouldn't. Too many people are blindly are willing to just say, well, X said I should use it, therefore I'm going to use it. I mean, I offer advice, but I always tell people, go well, find these things out for yourself. Don't be a sheep. Just don't blindly accept because somebody you admire says you should do something. This stuff is nonsense. What you should learn is empathy. This is the number one skill that developers are missing. And by empathy, I mean the ability to understand what other people are thinking and feeling. Too many people assume everyone else around them is just like them. It's a very toxic behavior. You have to show empathy for people empathy for other ideas, understand why people don't like your idea, and always be willing to back up why you think your idea is good, but you can easily do it without insulting people. I just see too much of this argument and insulting and calling people stupid and instantly dismiss dismissing ideas because um, they happen to do stuff. Because testing requires you uh, to, to change how you write your code. And as, long as I find out with all that toxic behavior, people don't like this. People don't like being told they have to do something different. Right? What do you mean I have to change? What's wrong, with you? What's wrong with you that you think I need to change? People can't separate their code from themselves. Uh, I talked about this in another talk. People, when they hear, I don't like your code, what they hear is, I don't like you. It's, it's not that at all. I, I, I'm okay. If you don't like my code, that's fine. But if you don't like me, that's a totally separate thing. I'm going to talk about that afterwards. Right? <laughs> but people like to change what they use. Right? People like the new and shiny. I want to use a new framework. I want to use yet another. Um, uh, 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 asset pipeline compiler, I want to use yet another uh, JavaScript framework because it's Friday and there's a new one available. People always want to change. <laughs> they want to change what they're using, but never how they use it. They want a new tool to like activate the parts of their brain that love the new and shiny, but they never want to change what they're doing. And they never want to change how they use it. They want the tools to evolve, but let them keep doing things the same way that they used to. And I always find it funny how the quest for the new and shiny never seems to include tools to help them make things bug free. Uh, so I've reached the end just in time. So my name is Chris Harches. The slide will leave this up for a little bit.
The slides are available. You can just go to speakerdeck.com slash Grumpy Canuck, and I have a whole ton of slides up there. Uh, these days, I'm a staff test engineer at Mozilla, uh, where I do a lot of testing with APIs. I'm a Twitter performance artist at uh, Grumpy Programmer. And please buy my stuff at grumpy-learning.com. I sell books there, so I can continue to tell my wife I promise not to spend a lot of money when I go to Grumpy. Thanks very much.